I'm going to be straight with you. Oh, well, that will make a refreshing change. Hello everyone, Jay Warden here, and welcome to my recap and review of the episode Absolute Candor, as the plot continues to crawl along at a glacial pace while Picard gets himself a couple of new crew members. Remember there will be many spoilers ahead for this and other Trek series, otherwise, enjoy. Once again opening with yet another 14 year flashback, Picard is visiting the planet of Vashti, where a large number of Romulan refugees have settled escaping the doom of their homeworld. Amongst this group are a bunch of all-female warrior nuns called the Kua Milat, led by Zani, who follow a path called the Way of Absolute Candor, which believes in telling the upfront truth all the time, which probably makes them really fun at parties. Amongst this group of ladies though is a young boy called Elnor, who is temporarily being looked after by them even though he's a male, though Picard is promising to find him a permanent home. After fencing with Elnor briefly, Rafi informs him over the comms about the attack on Mars and so he promptly leaves, promising to return soon and that the evacuations will indeed continue. Back in the present day aboard the La Serena, Gerati is trying to engage in some small talk with Rios when Rafi comes in and complains about Picard changing their course to Vashti, apparently wanting to make a side trip there to go on a guilt trip. So everyone goes to have a meeting with Picard in a holographic recreation of his chateau study and chat about their upcoming visit to Vashti, with Rafi still complaining it's a bad idea, whilst Rios warns it's pretty sketchy these days with pirates running rampant, with one warlord in particular said to have an antique bird of prey in his hands. Picard insists they need to go there and get themselves a warrior nun on their side, much to the amusement of Gerati, and he further explains that they're basically the most skilled badass ninja warriors this side of the Galactic Core, and we really want one of those if we're going up against the Tal Shiar or whatever else we might come up against. Rafi pulls them aside though and thinks that they really shouldn't bother with this place, instead focusing on the mission at hand of getting to Free Cloud, but Picard insists and know that he may never pass this way again, so wants to take the opportunity while he can. Over on the cube, Soji is looking over an old video record of Ramda giving an interview about an old myth involving the Destroyer who heralds the destruction of all life everywhere, something that might be worrying her a tad given last episode Ramda called her the Destroyer. Somehow drawn to her, she goes to take a look at an unconscious Ramda in the disordered ward, when Narek shows up to give her some moral support. She then joins Narek for a drink of Romulan L and wants to know how he knew she was at the ward, pointing out that despite him not wearing any uniform, insignia or rank, he is able to go where he pleases without any kind of authorization, asking him if he's Tao Shi'ar. He denies it of course, and even if he was, he'd still deny it anyway. She then asks if he can get her some records on the Romulan ship that was last assimilated, and says he'll see what he can do before dragging her off to some Borg ventilation room, asking her to take her shoes off, and then in the episode's most bizarre scene, both of them start sliding along the floor before having a passionate makeout session, yet also using this romantic opportunity to interrogate her about how she came aboard the cube in the first place, questioning why she didn't show up in the passenger list. Soji gets upset at the implication and tries to storm off, but Narek simply claims he's just trying to feed his curiosity about her. Arriving at Vashti, Rafi reports a planetary-wide security net is in place, preventing them from beaming down easily, and that they didn't respond very kindly to Picard's name. So, without much explanation, Picard somehow ends up beaming down anyway, receiving a chilly response from the locals, and it looks like this place has become a bit more run down since the last time he visited. His presence also seems to be noted by some suspicious-looking chaps who look like they might want to be causing some trouble later in the episode. However, once Picard arrives at the sanctuary, he's warmly welcomed by Zani, where he asks for her help, just as Space Legolas, sorry, Elnor, arrives. On the ship, Rafi becomes very concerned after Picard's presence has been noted by a large spike in comm traffic and not of the friendly variety, while Rios reports that the bird of prey he mentioned earlier is on its way towards them. Picard says he's not going anyway just yet, tells him to deal with it, and continues his chat with Zani. She guilt trips him a little regarding his decision to become a hermit for 14 years, something which hasn't helped the situation on Vashti with rampant poverty and degradation, and then inquires about his mission. He explains the deal to her, and realising it might be a hopeless cause, she thinks he should take Elnor with him, because although he can't ever truly be a co-op Milat, as he's a bloke, his fighting skills are extremely impressive and would serve Picard well. So Picard tries to sit down and have a chat with Elnor, explains his mission, and asks him to bind his sword to his quest. Elnor though is still clearly having some abandonment issues, has a mild tantrum, and then storms off saying Picard deserves to be left alone in his hour of need, just as he was left alone by Picard all these years. Frustrated, Picard calls the ship and says he's ready to leave, but it'll take a few minutes presumably to get through the security net. So Picard decides this is the perfect time to start some trouble by going into a Romulan-only bar. The suspicious looking chap from earlier gets up and introduces himself as a former Romulan senator, and then starts speechifying about Picard's promises all those years ago that ended up making them all weaker when he turned his back on them, clearly trying to rile the crowd up. Picard tries to calm things down, but our thug senator isn't having any of it, and has some men drag him away from the bar, tossing a sword in his hand, and tries to fight Picard in a duel. Picard however refuses to fight and tosses the sword to the ground, and then just in the nick of time Elnor shows up and implores the former senator to back the fuck off. Ignoring him he tries to swing at Picard, but before he can blink Elnor cuts his way through and promptly decapitates him. Elnor declares to the crowd that he's bound his sword to Picard and anyone else who challenges him will meet the same fate. Picard tries to calm things down again, apologising for failing them all in their hour of need, saying he's truly sorry. 
Luckily though, the ship is finally ready for transport and Raffi promptly beams both Picard and Elnor up, just before more thugs start getting trigger happy. Once on board, Picard gives Elnor a severe bollocking for killing the thug unnecessarily, demanding next time he only ever fight when he tells him to. Elnor reluctantly agrees and explains that he's finally decided to join because it met the requirements of the Kuat Milat, that it be a lost cause, filling Jurati with enormous comfort that she decided to join this mission. We check in once more with the cube quickly to a sleeping Narek when Rizzo wakes him up with yet more creepy sexual incest vibes, taunting him and demanding to know what progress he's made with Soji. He claims he's planted the first seed of doubt, amongst all the other seeds he's probably planted at this point, completely unimpressing her, but Narek insists his way is the best way and it has to be done slowly if they're going to find out where she came from so they can kill her and all the others like her. Rizzo insists the Cylons have a plan, then tries to briefly choke Narek before letting him go and tells him if he doesn't make any progress from the next week, she'll enact some classic pain and violence to get what they want. Finally, as our intrepid crew are about to try and leave Vashti, the old Romulan bird of prey shows up and engages the Las Arena. Rios starts to show off his piloting chops as they engage, but are pushed closer and closer towards the planet's security grid, risking their destruction when suddenly out of nowhere, another ship joins the fight and gives them a helping hand, severely damaging the bird of prey. Unfortunately for their would-be saviour, the ship is crippled when the bird of prey still gets one nasty shot off, so Picard gets the pilot beamed over, revealing it to be none other than Seven of Nine. Well, there wasn't reams of clunky exposition in this episode like the last three, and we're finally off Earth, and yet the plot still seems fairly stagnant, barely moving forwards, instead taking a diversion to a new planet to take on our latest crew member, Elnor, while the stuff on the cube enters a relative holding pattern until Picard and company can get there, I guess. I'm also starting to find this constant use of 14 year flashbacks in the beginning of each new episode a little on the repetitive side now, but I understand it's being needed in order for us to understand Picard's connection to this place as well as Elnor's relationship to Picard. But hey, at least 7 of 9 turned up at the end, which was nice, and may I say, still looking fantastic. Also, this episode was directed by Jonathan Frakes, aka one William T. Riker, who is usually a great director, and I think has a much better knack of making this feel a bit more like Star Trek. Again though, I'm still finding the show very middle of the road, with things I like and things I don't like. Patrick Stewart was back on fine form in this episode, compared to the last where I felt his performance was a little off, but this time we got several moments that felt much more like the Picard of old. I can tell he feels far more comfortable on a starship than milling around on Earth, and his attempts to defend himself and his actions on the planet against the angry mob were also some great little moments. First off, let's talk about the Romulan warrior nun thing. I'm feeling a little ambivalent about it. On the one hand, as I said last week, I appreciate all the world building and expansion of the Romulans as a culture, and that there are several separate factions now makes particular sense since the Empire collapsed and is something I speculated on. I count at least four separate factions now I think, the official Romulan Free State, the Tau Shiar slash Jatvash, I'm not sure if there's a distinction between them anymore, the Romulan Rebirth Movement was name dropped here, and finally the Kuat Milat. There's a degree of logical sense that the Kuat Milat's philosophy is ideologically opposite to the others, given how secretive Romulan society is. I mean, why not, if you're fed up with that kind of secrecy, to have your own little society that practices the absolute opposite? I'm just not sure about the whole warrior nun aspect, and that they're supposedly the greatest warriors ever known that we've never heard of before. The aesthetic of their little hut was honestly reminding me of Rivendell in Lord of the Rings, and then in came Legolas. Sorry, Elnor. Although, I suppose actually he looks a little bit more like Elrond. Outside of the sanctuary, it feels much more like we just entered a typical lawless firefly shantytown of some sort, and honestly I could have done without the scene-chewing angry Romulan who used to be a senator. As for Elnor himself, I really don't think we need a space ninja on this trip, and I'm less than enthused with the potential brattiness I see in him, given he's very young and felt abandoned by Picard. I just don't want to have a moody teenager type on this adventure. However, I really did enjoy Picard giving him a good bollocking for killing the thugs on the planet. I'm glad he didn't let it slide and is exactly the sort of reaction I'd expect from him. Remember when he chewed out war for killing Juras even though he was totally within the boundaries of Klingon lore? It's good stuff and I really liked that. Despite my concerns though, I'm not going to rush to judgement just yet on Elnor and we'll see how he progresses as the show goes on. Poor Picard though. Almost everyone seems to be very disappointed in him these days. Several times now we've had comments on how he's abandoned or neglected almost everyone since he resigned, seemingly having totally lost faith and given up, and to be quite honest, I'm not really sure I entirely buy this, as it just doesn't sound very Picard to me. 
I mean, this is a man who stood up to the Federation, defied orders and risked his career to save a few hundred Baku in insurrection. Why would he not try to keep fighting to help the Romulans, even outside of the Federation? Was he that totally crushed by his defeat and dismay at the new attitudes of the Federation, that he simply gave up and hid himself away in his chateau for 14 years? I honestly don't mind the story arc, I like seeing him pull himself together and go on one last adventure to save people and stand up for what he believes in. I'm just not a big fan of how he got there before the events of the show, I guess. A little inconsistency I picked up on here is in the last episode he tells Laris how the chateau never truly felt like home to him, yet in this episode has a recreation of it on the ship for him to relax and feel more comfortable in. Maybe it was just cheaper to film there instead of having to build a new set for Picard's quarters or some other kind of recreation like the Enterprise's ready room or his quarters there, who knows. But now that we're on the ship, we're finally starting to get a crew dynamic going, with our various characters bouncing off each other. I generally enjoyed most of this, though some of it comes off as a little Whedon-esque at times. By that I mean the sort of banter you'd expect from a show like Buffy, Angel or Firefly. Since Shaban and Loris have now left the picture, Dr. Gerati has now become perhaps my favourite character so far, and in some ways seems to be speaking for the audience with some lines that she throws out. Romulan warrior nuns. That's a real thing? How bizarre. She reminds me a fair bit of Tilly in Discovery, also one of my favourite characters on that show, having a sort of nerdy, bubbly nature with a tendency to babble in the presence of people and start vocally worrying when things outside of control are happening. At the moment though, she's just along for the ride and not providing any other use to the crew. Unless, of course, you buy the theory that she's a spy for Commodore O. Raffi in this episode was better than the last one, now that she seems to have gotten some focus in her life, keeping Picard safe and finding out information for him instead of drinking herself into an emotional wreck. I don't really have a lot to say about her for this episode, however I do think she is the weakest member of the crew so far, mostly just going around being upset about Picard's latest decision in the episode and trying to be the pragmatist amongst the crew. Rios proved himself a capable pilot and the character himself is actually coming off as quite restrained so far. He's certainly not swaggering about making smart-ass quips, mostly just coming across with a resigned, jaded outlook on things. He seems pretty focused on the mission otherwise, and even seems quite comfortable taking orders from Picard, which would make sense if, as Picard suspected, this guy is Starfleet to the core. We got to see two more emergency holograms, a hospitality one, and what seems to be an almost stoned, lazy-looking tactical hologram called Emmett. Exactly the sort of personality you want in charge of shooting things, right? I'm finding this all quite intriguing, yet somewhat puzzling at the same time, as to why Rios would program these wildly different personalities, yet also seem to have a very strong disdain for them as well. I've heard it suggested that Rios himself may be just a hologram, the emergency command hologram like when the Doctor on Voyager added it to his own subroutines. After all, he's reading a book about the existential nature of life and death, he hasn't left the ship at all yet, and the other holograms almost seem to be presented as various aspects of one's psychological makeup. I'm not really sure I buy this though, because in the last episode, our very first meeting with Rios shows him injured with some shrapnel in his shoulder. In my review, I had wondered what the point of this was, as it seemed to serve no purpose, and there was no indication of how it happened. Now I'm wondering if it was just put there to show us that he was indeed a real flesh and blood human, and not just a hologram. I do though think that Santiago Cabrera is giving a fantastic multi-role performance here though, imbuing each hologram with a distinct look and personality. The space battle itself was actually quite well done, fairly restrained and felt quite classic Star Trek in my opinion. You've got classic beam weapons, a gorgeous model of the TOS era Romulan bird of prey, shields down to X%, percent. the only thing it was missing was an exploding console or two. Modern Trek battles in both Discovery and JJ Trek tend to feel a lot more like Star Wars, a frenetic visual frenzy, also known as a complete visual clusterfuck. The battle in Discovery Season 2 finale Such Sweet Sorrow was so completely over the top and ridiculous, countless numbers of generic things shooting each other, where suddenly starships are fielding dozens of shuttles and hundreds of attack drones like fighters each, which to me completely breaks the general established rules of what I come to expect from a Trek space battle. Star Wars battles are fine and great within that setting, because that universe established the rules right back to the originals of huge capital ships supported by dozens or even hundreds of fighters per ship. So when it gets to a large scale fight, it's a huge verbal frenzy and the design of each side's fighters and capital ships is distinct enough that you know exactly who is who despite the chaos. 
Star Trek, on the other hand, is pretty much 99% of the time about capital ship combat, and even in its largest scale fights was still almost entirely big ships shooting at each other. The Federation did field squadrons of attack fighters during the Dominion War, but only in small numbers, and they were retrofitted support couriers. So yes, this episode's space battle is far more in line with what I expect and was visually entertaining. We didn't spend too much time on the cube this episode, and the plot there has largely ground to a halt for now, and sadly I'm finding most of the stuff between Narek, Soji and Rizzo all rather dull, cringy and uninteresting. I want to know more about the cube, the assimilated Romulans, and Soji's real purpose for being there. I have to say Rizzo is by far my least favourite character so far. She just comes off as almost cartoonishly evil, and I can do without this whole incestual vibe she keeps giving off with Narek. She just doesn't feel very Romulan to me, seemingly only ever popping up to remind Narek to do his job, pose suggestively to him, choke him, and then leave. The only thing I actually took of note from that scene is that their goal is not just to find out why Soji's here and where she was created, but apparently to find all the others like her, and a previous episode also mentioned a nest, so we could find out later that there are possibly many of these flesh and blood androids running about. That scene though where Narek does his little Borg tradition thing as he and Soji happily slide across the floor in their socks before an extended makeout session in between talking? I'm sorry, but I just found all of that very cringy, and this was literally my exact face as I watched it. Narek claims to be planting a seed into Soji, being careful not to trigger her, but I still think he's actually falling in love with her and will likely kill Rizzo in order to defend Soji when it comes down to it. Soji meanwhile starts to suspect Narek is up to something when he starts asking her about how she came to be on the cube, as there was no record of her being on the passenger list of the ship that got her here. But otherwise she just continues to be nothing more than a central plot point rather than a character, and reinforces this idea of a potential big doomsday plot, after she watches an old recording of Ramda explaining the myth of the destroyer and it heralding the end of all life. We just had this end of all life plot in season 2 of Discovery, can we please not do it again? I'm sorry if this all feels rather negative, I did still generally enjoy the episode despite its flaws, but I'm really hoping the plot starts going somewhere soon, and please no more 14 year flashbacks to set up another story or plot point. Let's just get things moving, let's find Maddox, let's get some more clues about Soji, let's get some more info about the Cube and the Romulans. The next episode suggests some of this might come to pass, and I'm pretty sure now Picard has finally got his entire gang together with Elnor and Seven coming aboard, so really we shouldn't be having any more diversionary stops. Let's find out with the next episode, Stardust City Rag. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did then please do check out my other reviews as well, and if you haven't yet then please do like, subscribe, and share. Until next time, this is Jay Warden, signing off.